Rid yourself of lofty aspirations and just be totally vulnerable. <laughs> Several years ago, these words were spoken to me in a dream. Um, and I am a filmmaker, and so I was making a couple of films, and I thought, this has to do with filmmaking somehow. I uh, was in the middle of trying to raise money for a big and expensive film, and um, I thought, well, maybe this has something to do with that. And uh, I'm here to say that this is actually the best filmmaking advice I've ever, I've ever received. It also turns out it's actually some good advice just in general anyway. Um, but first, I want to tell you a story how I came to realize this is the best advice about filmmaking that I have uh, I've ever heard. And in 2006, I made a film in New Orleans after Katrina. I just graduated from film school. This is the first time I came to make an independent film with a group of friends and collaborators in New Orleans. And we're going to tell a story about some people getting on after Katrina. Um, and this is a low budget film. We had a little bit of money saved up. Uh, one of the producers had a, had a savings. Um, but it was really a small film. It was about 12 person crew. Um, but uh, the film was called uh, Lo and Behold, and Lo and Behold went to the Sundance Film Festival. So within a year of graduating from film school, I was going to the Sundance Film Festival with my first film, and it was the first film festival I'd ever been to. <laughs> so needless to say, my eyes were big, and listening to people's advice, had all kinds of advice coming to me from all kinds of different people, agents, lawyers, other filmmakers. You need to make a bigger film, a more impressive film, something that will uh, you know, have a couple of seasoned producers involved, maybe some famous actors. And I thought, well, that sounds reasonable. That's what filmmakers do, right? You, you, each film is a stepping stone to the next, make bigger and more impressive films. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, and, and as you can see here, our, uh, the crew that we had was, was about 12 people. There we are, out in the, the swamps outside of New Orleans. So we said, well, get a bigger crew, you know, get, get a little bit more impressive. And this is, uh, it's been about a year, a year and a half, trying to get some sort of money to make a bigger and more impressive film. Um, and it was actually pretty stressful. But finally, I hooked up with a couple of seasoned producers who had had a lot of success, had a couple of name actors involved. Hey, this is going to be it. We're going to do it. Well, then they come back and say, well, we want to make it for half of that budget. Say, OK, half the budget. Well, we want to do it for half of that half. Okay, uh, the movie's set in the Southern California desert. We want you to reset the film to be, take place in Louisiana. And uh, we all know, of being, in Louis being from Louisiana, there couldn't be a more different climate than the uh, Southern California desert than the swamp here. So I'm thinking, this is just this crazy. And so I was getting very stressed, very stressed out about this. Um, in the meanwhile, I was also making a uh, documentary film. And this documentary film um, was about uh, five men who build really big things, like uh, castles, and um, mountains, and towers, and, and archways, and all kinds of big, big huge structures. They build these big, huge things with, uh, with no money, and with no blueprints, no financing, and mostly by themselves. One man um, had built a, 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 a castle made of stones from the mountain where he lives, with just you know, whatever kind of scraps he could gather together. And um, over the course of making this film, I started to listen to these men about their creative process. But working without blueprints, working without any kind of financing, and I kind of took some, took some, uh, you know, inspiration from that, and it allowed me to listen to this dream when it finally did come. And so, one night, as I was stressing about making this bigger film, I well, went to sleep. You know, waking up in the or right before I wake up in the morning. You know, sometimes you you have these really vivid dreams right before you wake up. And I heard this voice. It was booming like out of the clouds, like Charlton Heston or Orson Welles, but it wasn't a joke, it was serious, you know? Rid yourself of lofty aspirations and just be totally vulnerable. And I, and I woke up and I wrote it down, I said, okay, this is, this is what I needed, this is the answer. And I looked and I said, well, how does that relate to filmmaking? And I couldn't quite figure it out. Um, I wasn't quite sure yet. Um, but I thought, well, vulnerability, that's, that's being open, that's being kind of, you know, weak in a way, you know, admitting like, hey, I, I'm not prepared, I don't have the strength of will to achieve this big thing, but maybe if I can open up, maybe something else will happen. Around that time, a good friend of mine from Lafayette, where I was living at the time, Lafayette, Louisiana, um, a friend of mine is a uh, carpenter. Um, he pitched me an idea for a movie. He said, I think you should make a movie without a screenplay. I think you should make a movie without a budget, and I'll be your partner, and we'll make it together. And I thought, that is insane, you know? <laughs> I've been to Sundance, you know, I can't do that. <laughs> um, but then after a while I said, you know, that actually might be a lot of fun. You know, he's a creative guy, even though he's a carpenter, he doesn't know anything about filmmaking. I'll, this will be interesting, it'll be an experiment. We're gonna cast the film entirely out of Lafayette, Louisiana. Whoever comes to our casting call, we'll put them in the movie. Uh, we're not gonna spend any money on this movie. 
We'll make it in our free time over the course of a year. So the movie was about a 28-year-old white guy who lives at home with his mom and his sisters and kind of loafs about, drinks, smokes cigarettes and other things, and has a bunch of girlfriends and kind of a womanizer. But he hears a call to become a monk. So he's kind of in this chaotic life, and he's like, <laughs> I think I'll become a monk and uh, join the monastery. Um, but he's torn, you know, should I go with the women or the monastery? Um, <clears throat> well, in any case, uh, the film is called Lord Byron, and we didn't find, the 28-year-old the, the white guy that we wanted to be Lord Byron refused. He said, I'm not going to be in a movie, I can't, you know. So well, what are we going to do? Well, this guy walks in, Paul Baptiste, an uh, African-American gentleman from Church Point, Louisiana, obviously middle-aged, but yet he was special. There was something unique about him. So me and Ross said, he, and he walked in to the audition by accident, by the way. He, he was coming to the theater to do something else, you know, check on his friend. And I said, hey, why don't you come audition? He's like, oh, no, 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 I don't, I don't do that. And I said, well, just come check it out. And afterwards, we said, he's the guy. That's, we're rewriting the story. I was going to say we were rewriting the script. There was no script. We had, a, uh, <laughs> we had like an eight-page outline. And we rewrote it. Now he lives with his ex-wife and her kids and her, girl, and her, her boyfriend. Um, instead of being with his mom. And it turns into something totally different than we had imagined. And we ended up collaborating with a lot of the people that were in the film. Um, people that came to audition were, most of them had very little acting experience. Um, in some cases had never acted. So we had a, but we had a group of collaborators, artists, musicians, you know, creative types. For some of them were just friends, comedians, a couple of criminals mixed in there. And uh, we made this film, Lord Byron. And what happened in the making of this, and there's our crew, you know, there's just the two of us, really, me and Ross, my friend, and uh, his sister helped out half the time with the props. <laughs> and, uh, but in any case, it was uh, totally a step down from my previous film, you know, not, not step up, it was a step down in terms of, you know, all the advice I had gotten. But I was definitely kind of scared and weak. I was like, I don't know where this is going to end up. You know, I don't have a screenplay. Will this work? Um, well... We went ahead and we made it. And I want to show just a, a brief clip from the film um, that I think is an exemplary clip that kind of demonstrates the kind of process that we had and the community that formed out of it. So let's watch this brief clip. It comes towards the end of the movie whenever Byron has, has uh, forsaken his life of uh, you know, fast times and he, uh, he's gone to try to, to do one last hurrah at spring break. He finds himself in a hobo community in the woods and he meets uh, Nunu who likes to dance. Let's watch this clip and uh, see how this goes. Hey, 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 hey. I don't know how to sing too good. Don't know how to sing too good. But Bob can shoot me down. Shoot me down. What's the mean? Hey, hey. One, two, three. So the, uh, the, the clip there, okay, it's, no, it's totally out of context, but you see this man, Nunu is his name, he's also from Church Point, Louisiana, holding a stuffed monkey, and he's dancing around this little campfire. So when we were filming this scene, we saw, we see, uh, we were filming something else, and between takes, Nunu started dancing, and me and Ross said, let's film Nunu dancing, this, will, this is an important moment in the film, Byron is finally going to be enjoying some sort of community here, let's do this. Um, and it turned into this scene. It's totally improvised. Um, he happened to ha have this bizarre dance worked out. And then the guy behind uh, me, behind the camera, picks up his fiddle and starts playing the fiddle. We didn't ask him to do that. But all this came about because of this kind of collaborative environment that we had. Well, come to find out, this is a... Uh, dancing is one of the things that we started the whole film with. There's, a, there's an entire motif running throughout the entire movie of dancing. But we didn't plan this last part, but we were able to incorporate it in because of the... Uh, because of the collaborative environment we had. So here's the, the many instances of dancing in the film, the, the guys on TV that have the instructional video, the young girl who is trying to learn how to dance, she's not quite good yet, boyfriend who films his girlfriend dancing, the Dungeons and Dragons couple who is practicing for a performance, nightmarish kind of dancing, there's also kind of bizarre and absurdist dancing, and then finally when, when Byron, the main character himself, dances, uh, it is uh, kind of something of a farce and a parody and a bit comedic and, uh, <laughs> 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 and 
And then finally, the end is whenever Nunu dances, and it's the only instance in the film where there's a communal kind of celebration and kind of a joy surrounded the, surrounding the dancing experience. And again, this was because of the collaborative uh, nature of the process. You know, we couldn't necessarily plan any of this out. And so, in any case, you say, is this a success? The film got into the Sundance Film Festival. It gets a, a rave review from the New York Times, critics pick. You know, it ends up getting distributed by the Sundance Channel across all kinds of digital platforms. You know, and maybe it was the lowest budget film to be in the Sundance Film Festival, maybe ever, made for like, you know, $900 or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so is this a success? Well, really, to me, the success is, sure, that, that means people get to see it, but really the success that comes out of this is I've discovered a process and there's communities that are now built around the film, within the film, um, and in the audiences that follow. And so really now this is why I'll say that this is this, this rid yourself of lofty aspirations and just be totally vulnerable is, uh, for me, the best filmmaking advice I've ever received, and maybe advice just for day-to-day -day living. So thank you. <laughs>